Hi, my name is Norm Friesen. I'm here to talk to you about my article in Seminar.net that is about the fate of the book um, in education today. Now, the book is a simple, familiar object that uh, is marked by its depth, uh, is highly organized, has many familiar signposts, including uh, sometimes including uh, a nameplate of the owner, and of course, everything is organized in this art in this uh, medium by um, page numbers and uh, lines and a table of contents. Now, this object as a sort of container and presenter uh, of knowledge, a way of exchanging knowledge and a way of um, also learning and acquiring knowledge is, uh, has been called the most powerful object of our time. Media theorist Friedrich Kittler referred to it as the concrete form of the Western episteme. Now, the word episteme is from uh, Foucault's uh, analysis of history and of power in politics, and it refers in Foucault's words to the conditions of the possibility of all knowledge. And it's often something that's silently invested in practice. So the book, in other words, and the practices associated with it are epochally and epistemologically foundational. So the physical form of the book, its typical contents, the habits, and especially the practices associated with its use, um, and the way that these are learned are what is important to me in my paper. All of these things, these practices, habits, typical contents, everything else, can be together be said to constitute the paradigm for knowing, the knowledge for knowledge and for learning itself. But of course, we know that today the book is losing its dominance. Its basic form and practices have changed. Engaging with the book um, is a matter now of swiping and scrolling on a smartphone or a Kindle, um, not finding and opening a, a page to a page or, or uh, looking something up within a book. Um, our epistem epistemic imaginary has also changed concerning knowledge. Powerful data and knowledge are generally not shown as residing behind the covers of a book or the doors of a library. Instead, we think of these as places increasingly um, where the words of dead white guys um, are, can be found to reside or to hide these days. Um, instead, we imagine knowledge as, as coursing through networks, becoming tangible and visible only through the soft blue glow of a computer or laptop screen. Today's new and competing epistemic, even epochal objects, it is clear, are digital. And above all, um, this object, the uh, tablet or cell phone, Port these portable touchscreen devices um, almost inescapably function as a kind of antithesis to the book. Instead of drawing us inward um, and presenting us with something that um, has depth, the, the screen of the, of the phone or of the tablet um, presents a surface um, on which many different types of content can appear. Again, this type of content is something that tends to draw us not deeper and deeper into the, into the device or some inherent content that it has, but rather that it's something that constantly points and tempts us to things outside of any sense of self-containment, to the fragmented communications of social media, to uh, the latest text, tweet, or email, to the events of the day, to today's traffic, and tomorrow's weather. Now, the, the paradigmatic experience of using a book, on the other hand, um, again, can be said to bring into play questions of depth and of going into something. So we look something up in a book um, rather than on a screen. And uh, of course, there's the idea of reading um, in a book that gets, allows you to be lost within its pages. So now let me turn to education. Educational thought and reform, actually surprisingly, are not, in, traditionally speaking, and even today, um, champions of the book they actually have viewed the book as the enemy. Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a classic example. Writing in his book, Emile, in the late 18th century, Rousseau says, quote, I hate books. They only teach us to talk about things we know nothing about. And envisioning the, the education of his young pupil, Emile, he says, Emile at 12 years old will hardly know what a book is. And Rousseau goes on to, on to say that I am almost certain that Emile will know how to read and to write perfectly before the age of 10, because it makes very little difference to me that he knows how, uh, how to read before he is 15. In other words, it is precisely because books and writing are excluded from Emile's life 
that he becomes proficient in writing and also in reading. Dewey, writing over a hundred years later, says something much the same. He compares the, chi uh, the child who learns to read to one who, quote, climbs the pantry shelves. Just like climbing the pantry shelves to get out a cookie jar, Dewey um, imagines that, the, quote, the difficulties and dangers of learning to read will be lost sight of in the child's own absorbing desire to satisfy the mental appetite. Dewey concludes, the actual learning to read is hardly a problem. Children will teach themselves. Now, Dewey has a very interesting reason um, and rationale for this particular argument. It is, it is a reason and rationale that was, would be impossible for Rousseau to point out. This is namely um, that Dewey is living at a time when, as he says in his own words, the imminent intellectual life of society had quickened and multiplied. And he saw this as occurring not only through the universal diffusion of cheap reading matter, but also through technologies like radio, telephone, and the telegraph. In other words, the book as the one container and purveyor of knowledge and of news and of truth um, was already being challenged in his time. And this led Dewey to believe that schools need not any longer bear the peculiar relation to books and book knowledge, which they once did. It is no longer necessary or desirable, he said, that the schools should devote themselves so exclusively to this phase of instruction. Now, as high-tech media have expanded and multiplied um, many, many times over since Dewey's era, many have followed Dewey down this path and making the same argument um, in one way or another. So, for example, scholars of literacy celebrate multimedial multiliteracies that are supposed to help with more traditional reading and writing tasks. Or constructivists also want to see the free, free exploration of the child, whether this involves technology or not. Um, and um, see this as overcoming, quote, the difficulties of learning to read, as Dewey put it. But we live in an age today, not just of constructivism and multimedia, multiliteracies, but also in an age of internet gaming addiction, um, an age in which one out of five students have either dyslexia or an uh, ADHD or some other intention attentional disorder. We also live in a time of the first, quote, post-literate presidency, as some observers have noted. So in this time, we have to ask, have we not started to see the, the question of the book and of literacy differently? Um, do we still want to follow philosophers and reformers like Dewey in excluding the book from education and as seeing the two as, uh, <clears throat> as being separate rather than conjoined? And do we still want with them to break down classroom walls and school fences and to let the world in for more authentic, a more authentic experience of learning? My paper argues that, in, and that schools need to be a kind of place where the rare exploration of depth that is intrinsic to the experience of books takes place.